from Armageddon. Christina Ricci and Angelica Houston star in Vincent Gallo's Buffalo 66. And Clark Gable and Vivian Lee are back on the big screen in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> The clock is ticking and Bruce Willis is on a mission to save the world from a giant asteroid in Armageddon. One of the movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, and we'll take a look at the newly restored version of Gone with the Wind. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Armageddon is appropriately named because while you're seeing it, you will feel as though you've been in combat, visual combat and oral combat. This could have been the movie that was shown to Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange to make him sick of violence. <laughs> Am I communicating? We're talking non-stop action and noise. That doesn't make it a bad movie. Rather, the audacity of the way it has been put together eventually becomes almost amusing. The situation is this. An asteroid the size of Texas is hurtling toward Earth. Deep core oil driller Bruce Willis is called upon by NASA chief Billy Bob Thornton to help save the world. We're a little short on time here. Will you help us? All they gotta do is drill. That's it. No spacewalking, no crazy astronaut stuff. Just drill. So Willis recruits his own men, including Ben Affleck and Steve Buscemi. Their mission, land two space shuttles on the big rock, drill holes for nuclear bombs, and blow the sucker off its trajectory. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? Regarding the human element in the film, as little as there is, I was struck by the impact of young actress Liv Tyler as Willis's daughter and Ben Affleck's girlfriend. Do you think it's possible that anyone else in the world is doing this very same thing at this very same moment? I hope so. Otherwise, what the hell are we trying to save? Now, each element of their plan serves as its own action film, and director Michael Bay, his last picture, was The Rock which also was strikingly noisy, dares us to relax in Armageddon. Armageddon is blaringly intense. By the end, I didn't care whether Earth was saved as much as I wanted to survive myself. But again, if you get into this mood with this picture, I was laughing. That's a strangely entertaining and amusing experience. If you can stop blinking and of course take your fingers out of your ears. So a weird, truly weird thumbs up from me. Well, we saw the same picture, but my thumb is way down. I wanted to escape from this movie. I didn't care if the asteroid hit, hit the earth or not. I was afraid the movie was gonna hit me. And you know, yeah, it it's you. cut so quickly Absolutely. that there's no uh, a stretch of action that makes any sense or is comprehensible in any way. This movie, the entire movie, is cut together like a coming attractions trailer. Yes, no question. And it was bewildering. Or, or, or the TV it, ad for the film. It was aggressive and it was assaulting and it was too noisy. And I like The Rock. I gave The Rock thumbs oh, up. Okay. But this film, to me, doesn't have any kind of an arc or any kind of dramatic interest and when it stops for drama like when they're all saying goodbye to oh, each yeah. other before you know like seconds are ticking down if they don't get that bomb ready in another 20 seconds the earth ends and they're saying goodbye to each other on television me, i couldn't understand that let me give people one piece of advice if you go to a multiplex and it has armageddon in it do not go to a movie next door because no, there will be two down. there will be tremendous audio yeah. bleed. It's, it's assaulting. Yeah. Yeah. It really, well, I, it, it was too much for me. I, I just felt that it was. Uh, but I was smiling. Overkill. Okay. okay. Next movie and our next film is Henry Fool, 
The story of a garbage man who befriends a wandering writer and discovers that he's a writer too. In fact, a much better writer. The movie is the latest work by Hal Hartley, a rigorously independent figure in the world of independent film, who likes to examine the lives of outcast loners who exile themselves in the most ordinary of places, usually suburbs. As the film opens, Simon the Garbage Man, played by James Urbaniak, is curious about the strange drifter who has come to live in his basement. His name is Henry Fool, and he's played by Thomas J. Ryan. I go where I will, and I do what I can. That's why I'm in trouble. I'm sort of what you might call an exile. Simon is always photographed or posed as though he's looking at the world at an oblique angle. He gets beaten by a bully and is treated by his sister, a specialist in loose morals, played by Parker Posey. Mom, Simon's got a broken rib, a dislocated shoulder or something, and he won't let me disinfect the gash in his head. Encouraged by Henry Fool, Simon starts writing some pretty good poetry. But when he takes his manuscript to a publisher, he's treated as some kind of an invader. Aren't you the messenger? No. Well, then you must be here to fix the plumbing. Then some of it gets reprinted in a high school paper, and reporters are coming to interview Simon in the resulting controversy. Eventually, it even ends up on the Internet and makes him famous. Simon. The Parents Association at the local high school is calling your poem pornography. The teachers are defending the students' rights to exercise their critical taste and sensibilities. The county agrees with the church and considers the poem emblematic of modern society's moral disintegration. How do you feel about these controversial reactions to your poem? Henry Poole is such a strange and mannered film, I had to see it twice just to let it sink in. But once it did, I was left basically unmoved. It struck me as a technical exercise that started intriguingly, but lost its way. It's interesting. I saw it a second time to try and get it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's because I was more interested in Simon, much more interested mm -hmm. in Simon than Henry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we're in sync on that. And how about this? There's so much made over what is written don't you think we should have heard some of it? I think that would be unwise. Whenever they try, it's like a musical composition or something that's supposed to be so great. When you hear it, it's never as good. It's better just to say how good it is well, I would have, it mysterious. But I'd like to know the subjects that are being discussed. I mean, just give me a flavor for it. I'm, I'm, so much is built up in this picture. I think that's you know, well, teasing, that would, teasing not to give it. That would make sense if Henry Fool were really about the poet and his poetry, but I don't know what this movie is really mm -hmm. about. It seems to be like an exercise in ironic distancing from the material so that nothing really counts. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Well, again, it didn't count what Henry's life was about for me. Simon's life meant something to me. Okay, coming up later, an ex-con brings home a very surprising bride in right Buffalo 66. And coming up next, a look at the restored classic, Gone with the Wind. Who's there? Who? That man looking at us and smiling. The nasty dog. My dear, don't you know? That's Red Butler. He's from Charleston. He has the most terrible reputation. Scarlett O'Hara first sets eyes on Rhett Butler in that famous moment from Gone with the Wind, a movie where almost every moment is famous. The movie, which recently placed fourth on the American Film Institute's much debated and criticized list of the 100 greatest American films, is back in national release in a good-looking restored print that allows us once again to decide what it's really about. The first time I saw it, I took it at face value. I thought it was the story of the Civil War seen through Scarlett's eyes. Wellman, Wendell, White, Whitner, Wilkins, Williams, Woolley, Wood. Scarlett, you passed him. Oh, he isn't there. He isn't there. The second time, it was more like the story of Scarlett O'Hara, with the Civil War as a backdrop. As God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this, and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. The third time, somehow, Rep Butler seemed more contemporary, and Scarlett seemed dated. You do all divinely, Captain Butler. Don't start flirting with me. I'm not one of your plantation bulls. But this time, Scarlet has made a comeback in my imagination, I guess. It struck me as the story of Scarlet's passionate libido, which meets its match at last with the plain-spoken, unsentimental Rhett Butler. Here's a soldier of the South who loves you, Scarlet. Wants to feel your arms around him. Wants to carry the memory of your kisses into battle with him. There are 
Never mind about loving me. You're a woman sending a soldier to his death with a beautiful memory. Of course, the performances by Vivian Lee and Clark Gable are movie milestones any way you look at them, but the movie itself offers a slanted and sentimental view of the Old South, which comes across as kind of a courtly utopia just as long, of course, as you were not a slave. The film has a self-confidence in its storytelling and an intoxication in its epic images that still works no matter how much we might want to reinterpret its hidden messages, which is, gee, this was a wonderful time uh, back in the old But South. I think, Roger, your final viewing, uh, you come around to the right opinion, which is, it's Scarlet's story. Yes, it I is. I mean, this yeah. is, and it's a beautifully acted performance. Over the years, in talking to actresses, they always name this as one of the great performances of all time. She's, she, a, oh, man. she's a willful woman, and among the things that she, she has this idea of the Southern Belle who, you know, is attracted to the perfect gentleman, Ashley Wilkes, but actually in here she's really attracted to that cad, Rhett, Rhett Butler, and a lot of her motivation is more sexual, I think, now than I first realized. Well, it's just the energy and the enthusiasm that she expresses. She never, never strikes a false note. Fascinating character, and magnificently played. Coming up next, Vincent Gallo drags Christina Ricci to a family dinner she will never forget in Buffalo 66. Where's the thing on this car? How do you put it in gear? Where's the right thing? Here. What is this? Is this is this a shifter car? I cannot drive a shifter car, right? So we got a little situation here. Just released from prison, a lowlife named Billy Brown kidnaps a sex pot from a tap dancing class and then makes her drive him around in her own car because he doesn't know how to use a stick shift. That kind of screwy detail was one of the insidious charms of Buffalo 66, a film directed and co-written by Vincent Gallo, who also stars as Billy. Before I went away, I made up a few lies, all right? I said I was married. I also told him that I worked for the government and that I would be away for a long time. Now, what I need you to do is I need you to come to my parents' house with me, all right? And pretend to be my wife. The scenes with Billy's parents are hilarious and harrowing in about equal measure. They're played by Angelica Houston, who is completely obsessed by the Buffalo Bills football team. It's her only interest in life. And by Ben Gazzara, who is completely disengaged, except when he lashes out at Billy. Don't point a knife at a person unless you want to use it. I didn't point a knife at you. It was here, on the table like it that. It was not here. Point it over here. Over here. Honey, honey, just calm down, all right? All right. The kidnapped victim, who quickly seems to be running her own kidnapping, is played by Christina Ricci, who has emerged from children's roles to reinvent herself wonderfully well as a cocky, self-confident bad girl. What are you doing? What are you doing? What? Don't touch me. All right, don't touch me. What do you me. mean, don't touch don't me? You're supposed to be me. husband and wife. A lot of actors who direct films are concerned mostly with the performances, but Gallo obviously wants to play with the visual medium itself. He uses Super 8 film, unexpected flashbacks, home movies, tricks with time to create a movie where the real subject sort of sneaks up on you. Despite the way it begins, Buffalo 66 is not about crime or kidnapping, but about childhood wounds and the way two people who need each other this guy and his kidnapped victim can sometimes find each other even under the weirdest circumstances. I really like this movie. I liked it too. I would extend the compliments to the family. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had oh. many dis dysfunctional families <laughs> yeah. in the movies in recent years. This is one of the sickest. I this, mean. this, the scenes with the family were shot in Vincent Gallo's own home yeah. in Buffalo. And uh, Angelica Houston, at first I didn't even recognize her. She, and she, it's so funny because basically, when you look at the family pictures on the, on the, on the uh, counter, yeah. it's Jack Kemp and O.J. Simpson. <laughs> They're members, you know, there's hardly Buffalo, room for a picture yeah, of, her, Buffalo team, yeah. of her son. Yeah, I, I could barely recognize her. And let me say something about uh, Angelica Houston. I rank her as one of the very finest oh, actresses yeah. we have. Yeah. I rank her with Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. These are probably my two favorites. And uh, she's... Just magnificent in this She's role. She's terrific. And Bing Gazzara, of course, reminds us in this role of all of the stuff he did with uh, Cassavetes. Absolutely. Husbands. Dysfunctional nuts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're great. Coming up next, The Soldier, A Leopard, and Their Story of Survival in the Desert. Our next film, Passion in the Desert, begins in 1798 when a French painter and his military guide 
had become separated from Napoleon's North African army. Soon the painter, played by Michel Piccoli, goes mad from thirst, drinks up all of his paint, and dies. The soldier, played by Ben Daniels, struggles on. Death is near when he discovers an ancient temple, a nearby cave, and a pool of water. But the refuge seems to belong to another traveler in the desert. He names the leopard Samoom, and slowly, warily, the soldier and the leopard accept each other. Eventually, what develops between the leopard and the soldier is a form of love as the man and the beast frolic together. <laughs> Passion in the Desert is based on a short story by Balzac. It wasn't a story I was familiar with, and looking it up, I discovered that it was originally called A Passion in the Desert. Balzac's title suggests The Passion of Christ. The movie's title suggests just plain passion, and I, for one, was not convinced that Samoom and the soldier had much of a romantic future together. I don't know. I'm sure the movie was a real challenge. The actor worked closely with real leopards, but in the last analysis, this is a pointless folly. Well, I thought that the uh, amount of time spent with the leopard was just basically because they didn't have another story to tell. But that is the story. I mean, yeah, I mean, that becomes the thing because it's so striking and unusual. But... Uh, my problem was, I thought the painter was the more interesting character. How yeah. about you? Uh, well, the painter obviously was supposed to be one of these military historians who goes and paints the battles and so forth. Piccoli is a great actor. Oh, wonderful. This movie is about the guy and the leopard, and, and I just didn't want to see a movie about this guy and this leopard, and I you didn't really it. believe for one minute that oh, that relationship of course, of course. was possible. Yeah, absurd. Or yeah, I mean, yeah what, okay. I mean, you're sitting there thinking, what am I watching this for? You know, maybe it's a metaphor. That's the whole thing of what I don't know. <laughs> Coming up next, another classic has been restored and it's back in theaters. Bellini's Knights of Cabiria. When we come back, Mamba. So I pull into this gas station. <laughs> oh, classic over squeeze. Watch this. Release the hounds. Perfect pump. 2037. Oh. <laughs> right now, use your card at gas stations and get double membership rewards points. <clears throat> What's this, Dad? Uh, 1010321? Oh, that 10321 has changed to 1010321. 10, but you still get the same great savings. Still saves 50% off every call over 20 minutes? Of course, still half price on those long calls to Romeo in New York. Does it save all the time? Sunday, Tuesday, any day. Just dial 10, 10, 3, 2, 1, then 1 and the number. Easy. Easier than laying off this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> 10, 10, 3, 2, 1. New number, same great savings. This is the cut. Ouch. It only was washed, which let in the germs that caused the infection that could have been prevented by Neosporin. Compared to some store brands, Neosporin has an extra active ingredient to kill more strains of infectious bacteria. And Neosporin helps bandaged cuts heal four days faster. No cuts too small for infection to strike. Use Neosporin every cut, every time. Federico Fellini was one of the greatest and most life-affirming of all filmmakers whose movies seem to build almost musically in counterpoint and melody. His Knights of Cabiria won the Academy Award as the best foreign film of 1957, and now it's been restored and given new, retranslated subtitles. It glows. The movie stars Fellini's wife, Giulietta Messina, as a Roman prostitute who works the rough side of town. Her neighbor and best friend is another prostitute named Wanda, and here they vent their feelings after a pimp has tried to drown Cabiria for her money. But sometimes there's good luck too, as when a movie star brings Cabiria home with him. Ma dove abiti tu? Dopo rifornimento di benzina. Dove? Sulla strada di Ostia, diciannovesimo chilometro. E vieni fino a Via Veneto. E che sto Via Veneto io? The film shows Fellini's neorealist roots in its scenes of how desperate people live in a Rome that is still pockmarked with squatters and bomb sites. Ooh, e quello con la cioccolata è 
E i pinoli, ammappeli quanti pinoli, fare una pioggia. Oh, caro, grazie, sai, grazie. The waif-like innocence of Kiberia makes the film almost a fable. Giulietta Messina sometimes seems more like a sad, silent clown than like a prostitute. A lot of the individual scenes seem to have inspired similar versions in Fellini's 1960 masterpiece La Dolce Vita, but some viewers prefer the greater simplicity of this earlier film, and I think Messina's performance here is even better than in her most famous Fellini film, which was La Strada. Well, it's a magnificent performance, and I think she simply believes, and it proves something that I had an actress one tell me, an actor tell me, which is, if you think an emotion, uh -huh. you think it, the camera will relay it because, boy, she's spectacular here. You just, you know, ache for her, you root for her, all the way through this oh, yeah. picture. I yeah. mean, it's just, it's fabulous. It's and, and, and you use the, the, a silent, the silent era. I agree with you. You read everything off her face. To a great degree, you could look at this movie with no subtitles exactly. and with no dialogue at all. Yeah, but then at the same time, visually, Fellini is so inventive with his parades and his uh, nightclub and his uh, miracle of the Virgin Mary yeah. and his mambo scene and uh, the people who live in the caves underneath the street. Yeah. It's just filled with visuals. Yeah, but let me say something about that. Late in his career, Fellini was thought of by the general public as a, a, a man who dealt with spectacle and uh, the uh, grotesque mm -hmm. character. Here we go back to early Fellini and you see the raw, powerful emotion that was at the heart of this man. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's not appropriate to think of it that he didn't have this yeah. core it's element very in very pure. It's very oh, it's pure and very absolutely. simple. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Okay, now let's recap the films we reviewed on this show. A Strange Split Boat on Armageddon. The film's sound and fury eventually won me over in a laughing way, but Roger disliked it for exactly the same reason. Two thumbs down for the strange and mattered Henry Fool. Two thumbs up, of course, for the restored Gone with the Wind. And two more thumbs up for Vincent Gallo's offbeat family drama, Buffalo 66. Two thumbs down for the visually stunning but ultimately empty Passion in the Desert, which plays like a kinky episode of Wild Kingdom. <laughs> and finally, two big thumbs up for the restored Fellini classic, Knights of Kiberia. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web at siskel-ebert.com. And next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Lethal Weapon 4, starring Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. And also, Toys Go to War in Small Soldiers. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Okay.